Hey, and welcome back to Bible Talk. Um, hey, we're still in the book of John, chapter 8. And in the last video, at the beginning of chapter 8, it primarily, we spent a lot of time primarily talking about adultery. And some of the things that we kind of learned from the Lord's perspective is one, um, adultery for a, for anyone to just look for a man to look at a woman to lust after her he's already committed adultery in her heart so the Lord's letting us know that it starts with the intentions and the motives of our mind and our heart um, this 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 subject of adultery from the biblical perspective and the laws it was talking about a man desiring a married woman and for a woman to desire any man, be he married or not, you know, and engaging in relations. And so then um, it then we were talking about the plucking out the eye and the cutting off the hand and the eyes that window to the soul. And, and it was with our eye that we see and we perceive and we contemplate and desire. Right. That's where it begins in our the intention of our heart and our mind. That's what the Lord looks at. And then the hand, of course, is when we, you know, physically take hold of and we commit the act. And then some verses talked about cutting off the foot. So those it, it, um, we talked about that being figurative language, hyperbole, you know, being overly exaggerated to show how how bad the sin is, actually, if you will, because in, in, in talking about plucking out the eye, cutting off the hand and stuff, that's going to stick with somebody. He said to cut, pluck out my eye. Cut off the hand, that's kind of severe. Well, that's how painful and how severe um, and uh, that adultery, I mean, the, the, the effects, I'll say, of adultery in the end. It causes a lot of pain. Anyway, with that having been said, um, you can watch the video if you didn't see the previous video for John chapter 8. And there's so many other different resources that you can refer to. So we're going to pick it up in John chapter 8. And we were on um, verse 12, verse 12. And it reads, Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is um, the light of the world. I mean, first off, he is the express image of the living God. And and sometimes when I try to explain like the, the triunity of God, because God is spirit. We serve a divine spirit. And um, it, just let, let's imagine the sun, the physical sun, right? We, none of us can physically see the sun. I mean, like see it, it like out millions of miles away and see the physical body, the celestial body called the sun. We can't see it. But how do we know that it exists and it is there? It's because of the light that's emitted from it. So we look up in the sky, we see this light and we're like, oh, that's the sun. Well, Christ is the light of life. I mean, sorry, the light of men. And he's and that's how we know that the father, that's how we how can I put this? Um, that's how we know that the that's how the father is made known unto us is through the light, just like the physical sun and, and the light it emits from it. We see and we know, oh, there's the sun. And so when Christ was walking amongst men, he's the light of the world because he is the express image of the invisible God. And it is through him in and through Christ that the father reveals himself to us. And he enlightens men. He enlightens our minds and re begins and begins the rearranging of our thoughts. You know, it's the renewing of our mind that needs to take place. And that takes place when we are, when we desire relationship with the Father. And he draws us to Christ and makes himself known. So, but Christ is the light of the world. And he said that he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And the Pharisees said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. And um, there's a verse I want to show you guys. I was going to go to Isaiah just when we talk about Christ being the light of life. Because I like to try to tie the old and the new together. Because sometimes we avoid the Old Testament thinking it has no place here. But um, the New Testament always refers back to the old. And, 
and it's prophecy. And so if I go to Isaiah, it was the ninth chapter and the second verse, what, what was said there by the prophet was the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. That's Christ. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And so the shadow of death, I mean, we, we've heard that phrase before in the book of Psalms. And so I thought I'd share that too, because we're all under the shadow of death. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So Christ is the light that shineth in the in darkness and in the valley of the shadow of death because all of us are under that shadow of death meaning that we all will die at some point <clears throat> and then but then there are those of us who may be alive and remain when Christ returns anyway so continuing on um i thought this was kind of interesting it talked about thy rod and thy staff they comfort me cuz I, I want Christ is called the good shepherd He's called the Good Shepherd. And one of the items that a shepherd is known for, or one of the things, he's all when they have this crook, the shepherd's crook, right? And so I thought it was interesting. So I, I did some little Google searching and came across this in uh, Wikipedia. And it says here, the shepherd's crook is a long and sturdy stick with a hook at one end, often with the point flared outwards, used by a shepherd to manage and sometimes catch sheep. In addition, the crook may aid in defending against attacks by predators. I'm just going to pause there for a second because think about it. Christ snatches us out of the snares of death and through him we're given eternal life, the 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 hope of eternal life and relationship with the Father in the end, right? I mean, he's with us always already. And not only that, but he also defends us against predators, the evil one, evil spirits, those who may, you know, try to hurt and harm us. And it goes on to say, when traversing rough terrain, a crook is an aid to balance. Shepherds may also use the long implement to part thick undergrowth, for example, at the edge of a drover's road when searching for lost sheep or potential predators. And does Christ not say that he searches for, he came to say, search and save the lost. And he, there, there's a parable where he also says that, you know, which one of you having a hundred sheep, if he was to lose one of them, wouldn't leave the 99 and go search for the one. And that's what Christ does. That's what the Father does. He seeks out and he saves the lost. Anyway, so going back to where we were, going back to John 8. And we will pick it up where we left off. All right, and so there. So then the Pharisees would give him a hard time. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go. He knows where he came from. He came forth from the Father and where he's going to return, back to the Father. But you cannot tell whence I came, where, whence I come. And whether I go, you can't even, you don't even know and can't even say from where I came and where I'm going to return. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself. And the father that sent me bear witness of me. Now, the Pharisees, um, they already knew the law. And that's why they were saying, hey, you know, because it says in the um, in the mouth of two or more witnesses. And and I want to share that with you guys. So we'll go to Deuteronomy 19. Deuteronomy 19. Let me see my tabs here. 1915. 
And it says here, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. So, again, it takes two or more witnesses to establish a thing as being true. And so, as Christ said, hey, I, my witness is true because I bear witness of myself. And the Father bear witness of me. So there's two right there. And so that there confirms that <clears throat> my witness is true or my statement basically is true. So going back to John 8. Okay. And so we're at John 8. And I'll pick it back up at 18 again. He says, I am one that bear witness of myself and the father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, where is thy father? Jesus answered, ye neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. Um, then Jesus said again unto, unto them, I go my way and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he have said, whether I go, you cannot come. And he said it unto them, ye are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And so, it says here that they that they understood not that he spake uh, to them of the Father, and that was verse 27. But I, I think I want to point something out here um, when um, he says here that, whether I go, where I go, you can, let me see, I'm sorry, let me back up. Um, then Jesus said unto them again, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and you shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. And um, I want to make a statement here. I want to say that when he said that, of course, no, they cannot come now, but they can follow later. And that's because you have to die to go where he's going. Because remember, it says that when we die, our bodies return to the dust from which it came and our spirits return to he who gave it. But here's the thing. It's, it's, it says that it's appointed unto man once to die. We have to come this way, born in flesh, our spirits placed in these flesh bodies, and we have to die the first death, and our spirits return to he who gave it. Um, Hebrews 9.27 tells us this, as far as like it's a point unto man wants to die. Let me see if I can get this to come up. And I'm looking for Hebrews right there, 9.27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. But I just really brought us here to just to say, show you that it does say that it is appointed unto man once to die. Okay. And then in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, let me see, 12, 7, it says, so is a point unto man wants to die. So when we die, it tells us this, then shall the dust return to the earth 
as it was. Because remember when man, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life and man became a living soul or a breathing creature is what that means in the Hebrew. And the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Our spirits are, I mean, unless you actually watch the video for the world that then was, you're not going to get what I'm about to say. But nonetheless, we are now born in, we are born and our spirits are placed in these flesh bodies. And again, it's appointed unto us once to die. And then we have to take these, I'm sorry, lay down this body and return to he who gave it. Um, some may ask, you know, like, why do children die at birth and things of that nature? And I heard it said once of another pastor where he was, he, he would make the statement that when children die at birth and things of that nature, they still met the obligation of, um, you know, it's appointed unto man wants to die. Um, but he would say that those souls are probably, those spirits were too precious for this world. I mean, there's a lot of things to go through, trauma <laughs> that we experience sometimes in this life. And I don't know if that's true or not, but either way, I, I, I can kind of see how at least that obligation was met coming this way. So, if we go back to John 8, and I hope I didn't lose you guys with that little sidebar. Um, going back to John chapter 8. Eight. All right. So, so of course we can't. They can't. They cannot follow where he's going now. They cannot come now. But at some point they will die. Christ was on his way to the cross to die, and of course they weren't following him to that point. <laughs> they weren't following him to the cross, but at some point they would die, and then they. But they didn't get it though. And so, and again, the Jews were questioning, you know, is he going to kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And then he go, went on to speak that, hey, you know, I'm from, you are from beneath and I'm from above. You know, you're of this world and I'm not of this world. And I said, therefore, unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe that I am not, that I am, if you believe not that I am he, he shall, you shall die in your sins. He is the savior of the world. He is the light of the world. He is the propitiation or the atonement for our sins. It is his blood that covers us. He is our righteousness before the Father. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do to earn salvation and eternal life with the Father. There's nothing that we can do to earn it. It's a free gift given because of the Father's love for us and his desire to ha have continued relationship with us. He's a father who wants relationship with his children. And so much so that one, he dies on the cross, right? It says that now again, because remember, Christ came forth and proceeded from the Father. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Christ is the um, the express image of the living God. This God loved us so much that he shed his own blood. Does it not say that um, um, no greater love does a man have than this, than to lay down his life for a friend? In that one act, the Lord himself is calling us friends and he's, demonst he's demonstrating the very depth of his love for us, how much he loved us by laying down his life. And his blood being shed satisfied his own law that none of us could satisfy for ourselves or for anybody else. And that is where it's written. It says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Christ did it all. And there's absolutely nothing we can do. Our good works does not earn us a place in, in relationship with the Father in the end. It's out of our love and gratitude and thanksgiving for the Father that all we are driven to do works that glorify and honor Him by the Holy Spirit that abides within us. And the more you love him, the more you'll find your heart's desires to do those things that pleases him and to introduce or to draw men to him. Anyway, so continuing on, he's done a wonderful thing for us. 
Continuing on, verse 25, then said the Jews, I'm sorry, then said they unto him, who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. And so what did he say? So I figure I pull a couple of verses. Let's, let's see what was said. And so Luke, um, I had here Luke 4, 16, Luke 4, 16, Luke 4, 16. All right. Now, keep in mind, when you read the New Testament, a lot of it doesn't need any explaining, to be honest with you. And there's some parts that do. But I'm just trying to show you that um, there's four Gospels. And just imagine four people who saw a car accident. And then they're, when they're being um, uh, um, interviewed, each one is telling their story from a certain perspective, from their perspective. And there's going to be items in common, and there's going to be some items that others that witnessed the event did not mention. But when you read all four Gospels or you have bring all the testimonies or, or interviews together, then you get the full picture. So here in the book of Luke, um, Christ is in the temple and what he does, he's given the uh, book. He's he is given the book of Isaiah to read, and uh, the prophet Isaiah. And to me, this is something that he said from the beginning. So the, these Pharisees probably were in the temple when this took place. This is uh, John, uh, Luke chapter four, verse sixteen. And he came to Nazareth. So Christ went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom, it was his habit. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it unto he gave it again to the minister and sat down, and the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture or prophecy fulfilled in your ears and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth and they said is not this joseph's son and he said unto them you will surely say unto me this proverb physician heal thyself whatsoever we have heard done in capernaum do also here in this country and then We'll witness that during the crucifixion when he's hanging on the cross and they're like, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on down if you be the son of God. But anyway, so that prophecy that he read was the book of Isaiah um, chapter 61. Isaiah 61. Let's see. Did I pull that one up for us? All right. No, I did not. But you can go to Isaiah 61. I could pull it up, but I wanna, I'm going to keep on moving. So Isaiah 61, when you read it, there's actually, and that's verse 1 and 2 he read, but there's more to the prophecy. He stopped in the middle of it because the following preceding, I'm sorry, what follows thereafter is yet future and has not been fulfilled yet. All right, so. Um, the other place I want to take us is to John 5, John 5, 17, which we were there earlier we, in, a, in another video. So John 5, 17. But Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Okay. 
And so, but Christ went on to say, then answered Jesus and said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever the, he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. Okay. So, so they're all perplexed. Because remember, they're like, who art thou? Who art thou? And he's told them, he's like, I've told you before. So I'm just kind of sharing some verses here with you. Um, Colossians 2, 8 and 9. I mean, who is Jesus? Who is this man? Uh, what I want? Colossians 2, 8. Did I not pull that up? Let's see. I most definitely want to pull that one up. Yeah, I think I'll I'll pull it up real quick. All right. Colossians 2, 8 and 9, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ for in him or in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And like I said, we serve a Godhead, a spiritual being. A, it says God is spirit. And he took a form before he started creating. And that form is Christ. Christ was in the garden. We can even call him the tree of life, the source of all life, the source of life. And so when the when the Lord told Moses, you know, e, tell the children of Israel, I am that I am, Easha Ea, or I will be what I will be, he was that tower, I'm sorry, the, the cloud of pillar, the pillar, I'm sorry, the cloud, the pillar of cloud by day that led the children of Israel, and that pillar of fire at night. He was a burning bush. He could be whatever he wants to be, reveal himself any way he chooses. That's who he is. <clears throat> anyway, so continuing on, um, again, I'm just I'm talking about answering the question, you know, who saith thou? Who art thou? And um, Colossians 1 and 12, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light in Christ. Who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who, and we're talking about Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him, and remember, like I said, the father, this Godhead took a form and created and then began creating because it says here for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him and he is before all things he's the first I am alpha and omega he's alpha he's the first and the last the beginning and the end of all things. <clears throat> and by him, all things consist. Right? And he is the head of the body, the church. Because remember, the body of Christ is the church, um, which is made up of the body of believers. But he is the head of the body or the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in all things so that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is the first and the last. All righty then. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I just really want to focus on Christ for a minute. I mean, he deserves all honor, glory, praise. They're asking, who art thou? And I'm just trying to share with you guys some verses so that you can kind of know that we're talking about the living God who revealed himself in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And and so I had John 14 ready for you guys too. And let's see here. John 14, 6. 
Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us, or that'll satisfy us pretty much. Jesus said unto him, Have I been with you so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? These words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works shall he do, because I go unto the Father. So I probably went a little further than I wanted to, but nonetheless, who saith thou? Who art thou? It's the Father revealing himself in the face of Christ unto us. And if we go back to the beginning of this wonderful book that we're reading, John 1. Let's see. I thought I had it, but maybe I didn't have it ready. But remember, we were at John chapter 1. And I'm going to go there real quick, just as a reminder where we started. And we talked about in the beginning was the word. That's Christ. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. So just a reminder where we began. And then if we keep moving on down to. Well, remember, he said that I am the light. So it goes on to say that he uh, that. That was the true light. John bear witness of the light. That was the true light. This is verse 9, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. This is Christ. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We were brought forth and born of God. And the word was made flesh. Christ became flesh. He took on sinful man, the nature of sinful man, flesh, which were, okay. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So how do we behold God, the glory of the living God, in the face of Christ as the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth? So there you have it. Jesus, I mean, who is Christ? That's who he is. He's God. And so, um, and, and what a wonderful God that we serve. And and many of us don't even know him or can see him like as a loving father who wants relationship with his children. Some of us still view him as a powerful, punitive being that wants to zap you um, the minute you step out of line. I mean, he is a God of wrath. He is a God of anger. He is a God of jealousy, Um, you know, but there's a time and a place for all that. But the, the but the primary attribute of who he is is love he loves us all right so getting going back to john chapter 8 and the 25th verse was where they asked him who art thou and he said hey the same person i told you i was from the very beginning basically But we're going down to verse 27. It says, They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, 
when you have lifted up the son of man, then shall you know that I am he. Or actually, if you notice this in some Bibles that you'll have, you'll notice that words are italicized. And usually when they're italicized, it's indicating that that word wasn't really in the manuscript, but that it was placed in there. It's placed here for readability. But it goes on. So technically, he says, then shall you know that I am. Is what he said here. And I do nothing of myself, but as my father have taught me, I speak these things. And he sent, and he that sent me is with me. The father have not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. And G, then, G, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And I think I'll pause there because they're going, then the, the Pharisees are going to be asking him another series of questions because of his um, comment. And so, again, you know, Christ is our righteousness before the Father. Um, the Father revealed Himself unto us in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Um, we believe or we don't believe. I mean, we are all living by faith, whether we believe in God or not. I mean, we exercise and practice faith every day. And just for an example, when you drive down the road and and you on a two lane uh, road. In your mind, by faith, you believe you're going to reach your destination. You're not driving and thinking, oh, that car might hit me. Oh, that car might hit me. You're not thinking like that. You believe that when you get in that car, you're going to reach your destination. When you sit on a chair, you're not thinking like, oh, this chair is not going to support me first, you know, and testing it out. No, you just flop right down in the chair, full weight and all believing that that chair has got you. So we exercise faith all the time. We just may not exercise that type of faith in Christ. We may not have that type of faith in the God that we say we believe in. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, you know, they're being challenged by a king who set up an image and said, hey, if you, when you hear this music, and if you don't bow down to this image that I have set up, then you're going to be thrown in a, in a fiery furnace. You're going to be burned to death. And the type of faith that these men had was such that they're telling the king, you know, hey, we know that our God is able. Because he said, what God is there that can save you out of my hands? And they said, we know our God can save us if he chooses if he chooses to, but let it be known to you that we're not going to bow down to your idol. How many of us have that type of faith? Where are, That's really where the power of God meets you at that point where you lay it all on the line, trusting him. And so in that instance, they were cast in the fire and they were not burned at all. The men that threw them in, they died. And, they, and when Nebuchadnezzar was looking in the pit, he's like, hey, I, did we throw three in there? Why do I see four? And the fourth one looks like the son of God or the son of the living God, I believe how he said it, or the son of God. So anyway, let's have let's let's trust. Let's learn to trust, rely and depend on the one that gave us life and the one that is our rock, the one that is our soul salvation. He is our Savior. He is our God. Jesus, when you look the word up in the Greek, <clears throat> it's going to go back to the Hebrew word Joshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. That's Joshua in the Hebrew. And it means Yah saved or Jehovah saved. Some might even say Jehovah's Savior. It is the living God and Father of us all who has saved and redeemed, made it possible for us to be saved and redeemed. Anyway, I'm going to stop there. I thank you. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you, thank you, thank you um, for staying with me. Um, I pray that some of this information that was shared was helpful. 
And I'll close this out in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, I thank you just for being who you are. And thank you for all the wonderful things that you have done throughout all the ages unto this very day. For all the things that you have done, that you are doing, and that you will yet do. I thank you, Father, for your loving kindness, your grace, and your mercy, and for salvation in and through the blood of Christ. I ask that you will glorify yourself in the lives of men as we cry out unto you, as we come to you, Lord, with our burdens and our cares. May you help, Lord, those who are suffering from a broken heart, Lord, the lonely, the depressed, um, the oppressed, Father. Please rise, Lord, and show yourself to be strong. Comfort the hearts of those that grieve today. We love you, Father, and we need you. Draw closer, I pray. Um, Father, perfect the right heart and the right mind and the right spirit within each and every last one of us who believe so that we may become a reflection of who you really are and that we may be able to glorify your name by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. Hey, thanks again for joining me uh, for this brief moment of time. And until next time, Kirk out.